dean here at the time, Dean Poppensee, the story goes that he asked Dr. Levine what it would take to keep him here. And he said, I want my own department. And so that's when the Department of Avian Diseases was created. And so I came back right after they had gotten their own department here in 1961, which was nice. And we remained a department until I retired, actually, in the of microbiology. So that was good. By that time, I'd established a good team or effort at the college in, in our department. Uh, we had a, a Tone had gone through as a graduate student of mine. He'd finished. I kept him on. So he had graduate students. I had graduate students. And we worked as a team on Marek's disease. And one of the most exciting times our research. We, we did it as a team. We got together around the table once a week, and traded stories about what we were doing, generated ideas, uh, knocked down some things, built up others, and that was just a glorious time. So I was able to carry on a lot of research that way, which was nice. And, uh, so it was, I think that was an extremely productive time. We worked on the pathogenesis of Merrick's disease from the beginning, before Tone came. I got started on that with graduate students and myself, trying to figure out why this chicken becomes infected and lives, and that chicken becomes infected at the same time and dies with a tumor. And what are the differences? And because we had the, the ability here to have good isolation units, and by that time I developed some SPF flocks so that we didn't have other infections, didn't have antibodies to worry about, we had genetic strains, some of which we had, but others, Randy Cole down in the Ag School, came up with his, his uh, Merrick's disease resistant and susceptible lines, and we made them pathogen free so we could use them. We had reagents galore. We had a lot of virus isolates, uh, some that we got from others and some that we isolated ourselves. So we could sit down and one by one uh, work our way through this disease, uh, trying to figure out what was important and how it was important. And we put together what I think now is accepted pretty much as the, uh, the way it really is. They call it the Cornell model. And that's an appropriate name because a number of us contributed to it. People who found out that B cells were the first cells that became infected. They in turn died and stimulated a response that brought T cells in and they activated. And you could just go through step by step the various things that happened and uh, ending up with a tumor of a particular cell type. And so it was a, a very fascinating, interesting time to do all of that. And it came about just through this teamwork effort, really. And my part of the team was to lead it, first of all, uh, to guide some of the younger members, but also to participate, because I wasn't happy unless I was in the lab working. I wanted to be at the microscope. I counted the foci myself. I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to be part of it. Uh, I would even, uh, when we were working on the fluorescent antibody test as a, a means to identify infected tissues, uh, I had a technician, he would cut the tissues that we collected from one bird, and I would cut those on a, a freezing microtome. I would cut those from a second bird because it was pretty tedious work, and so I had two birds to examine every day through about 40 tissues or so. But I would do that, and I would help stain them, and I would examine all of them, of course. And that's what led us to the feather follicle work, was, was that work where we found that one tissue, the feather tracks were where the infection really was. And uh, we went to a little outside, helped to get some electron microscopy done, and found that we had the envelope viruses there, which were important. And, but all of that came about in a, just a systematic, sequential way. Steve Hitchner and I had sat down and each made a long list of all the tissues we should look at. I think that's in the, mm -hmm. the biography there. That, uh, we did that and skin was one of them. And, uh, that was the one that worked. Here I am. And, uh, I uh, <clears throat> had opportunities to go elsewhere, but I thought, gee, I love it here. I love what I'm doing. I don't need to chase rainbows. Uh, we had everything you could ask for here. Right. Had good setting. colleagues, a, a nice setting, everything we want for research. And uh, also I was lucky enough to have research support. I had support for 29 years, so I had lots of, lots of good support. 
and it really made it. Now, why would I want to leave a, a deal like that? And so, so I, I decided to stay. I never regretted it. It's, the only thing I regretted was having to do the darn administrative work for hours and hours and hours at my desk. Enough so my wife one day decided that I was at the desk too much. She came into my office at home with a copy of Women's Day. You know what Women's Day is? Magazine? Mm -hmm. and it had plans in there for a pair of salt and pepper shakers, wooden ones. Why don't you make a pair of these things? So, well, okay. So I went down. I had a little workshop downstairs. I went down and made a pair like that. Oh, that was kind of fun. Must be a million ways to make salt and pepper shakers. So <laughs> before uh, more than a very few weeks went by, I'd made 22 pairs of different, every one different style of salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> Jeez, what am I going to do with these? <laughs> <laughs> and my wife uh, very wisely said, well, they've got this New York State Craft Fair that's up at Ithaca College every year. Why don't you take them up there? I so, oh, they'd never take these. Well, how do you know? Because every, every piece was juried for that particular craft fair. Mm -hmm. And so I took them up. They accepted every one. I sold every single pair. Wow. Made $250 or something like that. This is way back in the mm -hmm. oh, I don't know. It was in the early 70s, I suppose. And uh, I had enough money to buy a tool. <laughs> so I went out and bought a nice, uh, what did I buy first? A, a belt and disc sander, a big Sears belt and disc sander so that I could make salt and pepper shakers easy. Uh, I started making furniture too. We made some shaker style furniture and uh, one of my colleagues here at the vet school wanted me to make a clock, a, a big uh, grandfather clock shaker style. So I made a replica of a shaker clock, clock sold it to him and Julius and Catherine Fabricant wanted me to make a wall clock for them so I made that. And I'd already made one clock for myself, uh, a little table clock. And that got me started with clocks, things that's so smart. I just loved it. And one of the nice things was I could intermix that with my, my work uh, at the university because it, it's something you can pick up or put down when you want. I could go downstairs and sand for an hour if I wanted to.